All right, now, um, before we get started in this chapter here, what, what I'm going to be preaching about this morning is going to be understanding the Old Testament. There's a lot of misconceptions. A lot of people don't really understand how the Old Testament plays into, you know, the New Testament. Obviously, we're living in the New Testament. You know, we're, we're in the times after Jesus Christ has already been, you know, has already died and, and been buried and rose again from the dead. And, and that was quite a long time ago already. And, you know, the Old Testament, if you look at your Bible... I'll show you real quick. The Old Testament is the vast majority of the Bible. So this is the New Testament. Right here in my Bible. This is the Old Testament. Okay? There's a lot of stuff in this Old Testament. And the thing is, there's a lot of misconceptions. And a lot of people these days want to just throw out the entire Old Testament. And say, well, we're in the New Testament now. We don't need the law. We don't need those old rules. We don't need that stuff. But that's just not true. I mean, God didn't give all of this revealed word for us, you know, not for us today and just for some people then. It's not true. And we're going to go, I'm going to help you. We're going to go over some tips, first of all, to kind of just help understanding when you're reading the Bible and how we ought to read the Bible and, and tips to help you to understand some principles that are going to be helpful for for forming doctrine and understanding what you believe about the Bible. The first tip we're going to go over is that you should always use a clear statement in the Bible as the foundation for your doctrine. And if something's a little bit more vague or a little bit unclear, you can use that to help support something that is already clear. But I wouldn't take something that's vague or unclear and just start forming and say, you know what, the Bible says this, even though it's not very clear, and kind of come up with, with, a, with a belief system based off of that. And that's what a lot of the false, the false teachers and false religions will do, is, is they take these, these hard to be understood maybe or, or not, not very clear verses, and they'll make, a, they'll make a doctrine out of it. And a good example of that is found in James 2. Because people will use... James 2, to try to make you think that you have to do works in order to be saved. And if you didn't know anything else about the Bible, and if you saw something in here, I can see where you might be a little bit confused about that. But I want to help you so that you don't get confused with Scripture in the Bible, and that you can use these principles of saying, well, look, there's a clear statement right here that says one thing. This other thing as a question or it's just not very clear. If I don't understand it, I'm not going to worry about it right away. It'll come in time. It'll come in time as you build more and you learn more about the Bible. It says, um, now nah, where we should start in James 2. Because I just want to expose this to you and just show you what people will say. Because you'll, you'll be hit with this. If you talk enough about the Bible and if you say, no, no, you're saved by faith. I guarantee you, you do it long enough, someone's going to come to you and say, no, no, you need to have works. And they might point to this, to this chapter. It says, uh, I'll start reading in, in verse 14. It says, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Now, first of all, right off the bat, this is a question. This is not a clear statement from the Bible saying, if a man does not have works, then faith cannot save him. Now, if it said that, that would be one thing. That would be a clear statement. This is just a question. What does it profit? So you're saying, what does it benefit? Though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? So, first of all, it doesn't say he has faith. It just says he says he has faith. And then it says, can faith save him? So, right off the bat, that's just a question. And then he goes on, he says, If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? So he's saying, look, if someone comes to you and they need food or they need clothing, and you're like, yeah, yeah, be filled and, and be warm and have a good day, and you like don't actually give them food or you don't give them clothing, you're like, you didn't do them any good just by saying, hey, you know, have a good day. But he says again, what does it profit? So in that situation, that doesn't profit the person anything. It says, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Now that is a statement. It says, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. So can our faith die? Is it possible for our faith to die? Yeah, absolutely. But here's the thing, and this is, this is critical. It doesn't mean you lose your salvation because the Bible says that 
You have eternal life or everlasting life, and that lasts forever. The way you receive that is by putting your faith in Christ. So the moment you put your faith in Christ, you receive that gift of eternal life. But it doesn't say you have to, you have to keep believing in order to keep everlasting life. It says that's the, that's the way that you receive it. The same way I would reach out my hand and, and receive a gift. Once I have that gift, I don't have to keep on reaching out my hand and doing that. We put our faith in Christ. You do that one time, you, then you receive that gift. That gift is yours forever. It's everlasting. So can your faith die if you're not doing any good works? Yeah, of course it can. That's what the Bible says right here. But again, don't let people twist this into saying, well, no, then you could go to hell. It says, uh, we'll continue on here because there's a few more things that are a little like they like to use. It says, yea, a man may say, thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. A lot of people I've heard say this, they say, oh yeah, well, you know, believing isn't enough because the devils also believe and they're not saved. Well, again, look at what the verse is actually saying. It says, thou believest that there is one God. Lots of people believe there's one God. That doesn't make them saved. Salvation does not come just by believing that there's one God. I mean, Muslims believe there's one God. Lots of religions believe there's one God. But you have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be saved. You have to put your faith in Him. That's where salvation comes from. It's not, it's not just that there's one God. So yeah, of course the devils believe there's one God. And besides that, I mean, it's kind of silly to equate devils with humans. I mean, it's, it's not necessarily the same rules. You know, they're, they're, they weren't... Um, God didn't lay out salvation for them um, the same way that he did for us. And then it says, we'll continue on here, it says, But wilt thou know, vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. So here we have another statement, but, then it's, but what he's saying is you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. So what James 2 is teaching us is that this is talking about being justified before man. So you can be justified before man and justified before God. Being justified before God is putting your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. God can see your heart. God knows whether or not you put your faith in Christ. Now, other men might not know that. I don't know for sure if you put your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. I can't see your heart. I don't know that. But what I can see are other things. I can see your works. I can see the things that you're doing. So what he's explaining here and all of this stuff, that's why he said, look, if someone comes to you and they need food and they need clothing and you don't help them out, you're not benefiting them at all. It doesn't do them any good. If you have faith, and you don't have any works, you're not doing anything to help any, anyone else out, you're not, you're not doing the things to serve God, that's not going to do anyone any good. Now, you, of course, your soul is still saved, but you know, your faith is going to die when you're not doing the good works. And that's what James 2 is teaching. So that's just an example where you know, we saw a lot of questions, and you've got to be real careful about, about the things that you're reading, and that you read them carefully, because people will take that, and they'll try to say, look, this is work salvation. Now, the other thing I want to mention, too, is that if you have a mountain of evidence and you see clear statement over and over and over and over and over and over again in the Bible, and I mean, I remember when we were talking yesterday, Chad, I showed you lots of different verses that explain that, that being saved is, by belief, is just by faith alone, right? I mean, there's, we, we saw, you know, John 3.16, John 3.18, John 3.36, Acts 16, 30, you know, I mean, you go on and on down the line, and those verses are really just, just, just cut to the chase. This is a clear, standalone verse. You can read it and understand it. And there are hundreds of verses like that about salvation in the Bible that say it's just through faith, it's just by believing. That's all you have to do. If you come across one verse in the Bible that looks like, oh man, I, you know, is it works too? You can't throw out the other just hundreds of verses that already said it's by faith and now just say, oh, well, because I saw this one thing, maybe you, know, you have to have works too. No, you're probably just misunderstanding that one verse. You probably just don't get it because here's the thing, this is, and this is my second point, is that 
The Bible is without error. The Bible is perfect, but God's word does not contradict itself. If it did, it wouldn't be perfect. It wouldn't be from God. If, if God's word had contradictions and, and it says one thing here and another thing here and they just don't line up, God's not like that. God is way more perfect than that. He's not going to he's not going to to speak out of both sides of his mouth. He doesn't do that. God is faithful and true and there is no lie in him and he speaks the truth. So his word, now here's the thing, if you have a Bible that does contradict itself and and it's clearly then it's not the word of God. But but the thing is, and there's a lot of Bibles that are like that out there today. There's over 400 versions of the Bible in English. And I'll tell you what, they don't all say the same thing. They actually all say something different because they have to be copyrighted. In order for the copyright to go through, it has to be different than other versions that are out there. So it, it, it has to be different. They have to say different things. And I'll tell you what, God didn't say 400 different things. He said, well, you know, his word, he gave us a one word. And that's why we use the King James Bible. This was translated in English in 1611. It's been four, you know, four or 400 years in the English language, translated from the other languages. You know, the Bible's been around forever. God has preserved his word. But if you run across something that appears to be a contradiction and you know you have God's word, then, again, you're probably just misunderstanding it. And just to kind of prove that the scripture is inerrant, I got a couple verses here. John 10, 35, uh, Jesus said, If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said I am the Son of God. So Jesus said the scripture cannot be broken. So God's word, God's scripture, it can't be broken. It can't be, you know, like, it's, if, if God said something, it's going to come to pass. It's not, it can't just be broken. It has to be true. It's, it's the truth. It's God's word. And then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, the Bible says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So they're saying here, look, when we came to you, and when we preached God's word to you, you didn't just say, oh, yeah, that's just man's word. That's, that's just your opinion, and that's just what you think. He said they received it as it is in truth, the word of God. It's God's word. That's why we go out and we bring the Bible with us, because I want to show people God's word. My opinion means, means nothing. It's what, it's what God's opinion is what matters. God's word is, what, is where the truth is. This is where we have truth. So, you know, first, use the clear statements. When you read the Bible and you see clear statements, you know, Read through the whole thing cover to cover. Make sure, first of all, make sure you're getting everything in context. It's very important for you to, to read the Bible on your own and, and to not be deceived because there's lots of people out there looking to deceive you. I want you to learn the Bible for yourself. Use the clear statements to start forming what you believe. Take something, if it's, if it's real clear, you say, boom, yeah, I believe that, that's clear. I don't have to doubt that because it says it, it, says it very clearly. Understand that the Bible is, is, is perfect, it's without error. If you see something that's a contradiction, well, you might need to, to, to think about it some more and, 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 and study it and, and uh, you know, let, it, let it sink in to be able to understand it. And if there's things that look like contradictions, maybe you might want to, before you get totally settled on what it means, really, really uh, pray about it and, and think about it. But then in, um, go ahead and turn to Ephesians 3. If you're in Galatians, Ephesians is just the next book of the Bible. We're going to do Ephesians 3. So there's a few pages to the right from Galatians is Ephesians. And turn to Ephesians 3. We also need to use the New Testament to help us understand the Old Testament. That's what my sermon's about today is understanding the Old Testament. Now, the Old Testament, I'm going to get into this a little bit, was given to that time, but it doesn't mean that it's null and void today. So especially when we're reading the Old Testament, if there's something that's not clear, let's look to the New Testament for the answers. And, and this is why. In Romans 16, 25, you don't have to turn there, the Bible reads, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now was made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith, he said, there's a revelation of this mystery. There's a mystery that was kept secret since the world began. And this was in Romans. This is in the New Testament. This is the, the, the Apostle Paul writing an epistle to the Romans. 
saying that, you know, there's a mystery that was kept secret since the world began, but now it's made manifest. Now it's made known. There's a lot of things that were unknown to people in the Old Testament because they didn't have all of the Word of God. God didn't reveal all of His truth unto us until after Jesus Christ came. The Bible says in Hebrews 1, um, God who at sundry time in a diverse manner spake in times past unto the fathers um, by the prophets hath in these last times spoken to us by His Son. So He's... Um, Jesus Christ is finally revealed when he came to this earth. A lot of, a lot of mysteries, a lot of dark secrets. And then the apostles, of course, went and, and spread that abroad. So there's a lot more learning going on. And there's a lot more understanding of the scripture in the New Testament. Look in, um, you're in Ephesians chapter 3. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me, you word, how that by revelation... He made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So, you say, again, it's the same thing. Look at in verse 3, it says, By revelation he made known unto me a mystery. Revelation is just something that's revealed. God used the Holy Spirit to reveal unto Paul these truths. And he said, he's revealed this mystery unto me. And in verse 5 it says, which in other ages, in other times, was not made known unto the sons of men. So the sons of men, they didn't, they didn't know this before. In times past, they didn't know that. And then um, in verse 9, jump down to verse number 9 real quick. Because it says, uh, and to make all men see... What is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ? So there's some things that God had hidden in the Old Testament. And because they didn't have the, the entire word, there's things that just maybe they didn't quite understand. And, and the Bible was not complete. Now the Old Testament has the revelations. It has, I mean, even it has a book called Revelation. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. It's a revelation given to John by God. God's finally revealing more stuff for us to understand, and he's opening up the scriptures for us to understand, because there's a lot of dark sayings in the Old Testament. There's a lot of things that are, that are maybe harder to be understood. There's a lot of things in the Old Testament that are, that are pictures and symbols, and, um, and were there for the people then to understand, but, but they're not as clear for us today. So we need to use the New Testament to help us to understand the Old Testament. Now, the Old Testament, of course, when I talk about the Old Testament and New Testament, the Old Testament contains all the scripture that was revealed prior to Jesus Christ coming on this earth. That was all the prophets and everyone that was, that was used to give us God's written word prior to Jesus Christ. So, a little, just a little overview of the Bible, of the Old Testament. The first five books, they're called the books of Moses. You have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That is where the, the, the bulk and the heavy law is just laid out. You know, those are also called the books of the law. God, God gives us all these rules and all these restrictions and said, you know, you want to do this. You know, that's where the Ten Commandments are found. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. You know, all of those commandments are given in the law. And those are the books of Moses. Those are the books that Moses penned down. And it gives us the creation story and, and everything else. And then you get into the historic books which would be from, from the book of Joshua through Esther. And those kind of give more of a history and things that happen after, um, you know, after the Exodus, after the, the children of Israel come into the Promised Land. And then you have the poetic books, which would include Job and Psalms and all the way through Song of Solomon, you have Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Those are, those are you know, Psalms is a song book. It's the biggest book in the Bible. If you open up your Bible right in the middle, you probably land in the book of Psalms. And, um, and it's really just a collection of songs. And um, those are known as just, you know, the more poetic books. Then you get into the major prophets. You have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and, um, you know, Lamentations is in there. And, and, and those, are, those are the real big, heavy books. So, like, they're real long. And, and it's, just, it's just from that prophet, you know, from Jeremiah, from Ezekiel. And um, those are called the major prophets. Then you get into the minor prophets. Those are all the little books from Hosea to Malachi. Um, just right before you get to the New Testament. They're, they're usually a lot shorter, just a few chapters or whatever. 
And then, um, and that's the entire Old Testament. Let's just give you a little bit of overview of, of how the Old Testament's laid out. Now, if you want to understand the Old Testament from the New Testament, one of the best places you can look to is the book of Hebrews. Now, the book of Romans also has a lot of information in it, but Hebrews, Hebrews is a book that deals with a lot of the differences and the changes that were made to the Old Testament law and given to us in the Old Testament. And, and I think the reason is because you know, Hebrews, the Hebrews were the, people, the children of Israel. That was who they were, like, like their, their race or whatever. Racially, they were the children of Abraham. So the Apostle Paul writes this epistle to the Hebrews, to the people who had grown up and had learned the law, and, and they had been given the Old Testament. And that's just, you know, these were the people that, that were, by, by nature, had inherited those things. And um, that's why Hebrews is a really good book where he really breaks down understanding what has changed in the Old Testament and what is not there anymore in the New Testament. And um, what I'm going to deal with mostly today is, you see, the Old Testament contains the, the first covenant. And I, I broke this up. I've got lots of pages. No, don't worry. We're not going to go through all this this morning. This is a two-parter. We're going to finish up tonight because there's so many things to cover. But I'm going to focus mostly just on the salvation because there's a lot of people who think that people were saved differently in the Old Testament than they are today in, in the New Testament, and that's just not true. Now, the Old Testament, the reason why they think this is because the Old Testament has all these laws, and, and it's known as, you know, there's, a, there's an old covenant that God made. A covenant's just a promise. And that's basically the laws. And in Deuteronomy 27, 26, he said, Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them. And all the people shall say, Amen. But see, that covenant, see God, basically he gave them, you have a bunch of blessings, you have a bunch of cursings. Look, if you obey my law, if you follow my commands, if you do all this stuff, I'm going to bless you, you're going to do great, you know, everything is going to go well for you. But if you disobey, if you, if you don't follow my commands, if you don't obey my commandments, you're going to be cursed. You have all these cursings upon you. And it makes sense, but the problem is that that covenant was not sufficient for humans because we break the law. And that means that we all, we've all fallen under that curse. And I want to explain, though, that, that it's not that the people of the Old Testament were either perfect and just obeyed the commandments properly because they didn't. They were not perfect. It's evidence throughout the Bible that they weren't. It was never possible for us to be perfect like... Um, like it's just same way, it'd be the same way it is today. Is it possible for you to be perfect today? It was just as possible for them back in the Old Testament. They had the same curse of the law, and they were in need of a savior or a redeemer, the same way that we are today. And um, you know, we don't believe in the, there's a term that's called dispensation dispensationism. And what they teach is that oh, you know, there was different ages throughout history, and they all had different rules applied to them as it goes. And here's another thing for understanding the Bible. If someone has to like, if you have to go through all these different hoops and do mental gymnastics in order to understand what the Bible is trying to tell you, it's probably a false doctrine. You shouldn't have to, 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 to go on a rabbit trail to try to understand just a truth about the Bible. God is not the author of confusion. God wants us to understand his word and he lays it out. You know, what the Bible says, it says, take it for what it says and just believe it. You don't need to go try to make it say something it doesn't and use all kinds of different scripture to say, well, see, look here, it, it does this. No. It says what it says and we ought to just believe it. And um, people have always been saved the same way. Let's take a look at Hebrews chapter number 10. Were you in Ephesians? If you're still in Ephesians, you go a little bit further to the right in the Bible and you're going to find the book of Hebrews. And we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews is a little bit longer than most of the books in the New Testament. We're going to take a look at Hebrews chapter number 10. And in verse number 1, the Bible says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. Now, in the law, if you remember, 
they used to give sacrifices. Part of the law that was given was that they would have to come in at all these different sacrifices for sins or for peace offerings, for, you know, for all kinds of different offerings. And they'd bring an animal sacrifice. They'd bring a lamb or a goat. They'd bring, they'd bring um, you know, turtle doves. There's all different, different offerings that they made. And these were made for atonement for them so that when they sinned, they would bring this up and to reconcile themselves to God and say, okay, you know, I've sinned. I'm sorry here. I'm going to bring my offering in to make it better. But he's going to explain what was the purpose of that. What was the whole purpose that they even did that? Because today we don't do these sacrifices. We don't do animal sacrifices and burn it on an altar to God. And there's a very good reason for that. We're going to get at it real quickly here. But it says there in verse 1, it says, The law, having a shadow of good things to come, not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers that are too perfect. Said, those sacrifices could never make you perfect. The people who brought them, those sacrifices could never make you perfect. It says, For then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Look at verse number four. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. He lays it out there very clearly because people try to tell you, and this is something that I was taught and that I believe um, when I grew up in the Presbyterian church, that, that people were saved through those offerings and that they had to do that in order to be saved and go to heaven. And yet, I mean, every year they had to bring these, these sacrifices and they, you know, they would kill them. And that's how they would get saved, and they would be good for a while, and then they'd have to keep doing that every year. That's works. That's, that's the work they had to do to bring in. That's not how they were saved. He explains it here in verse 4, and that's why we're using the, the New Testament to help us understand the Old Testament. He said, look, it's not even possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. It can't happen. Turn back to chapter 9 of Hebrews. Where you're in chapter 10. It's just, it should be on the same page, maybe one page back. In verse 15, it says, And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So, pay attention to that term, the promise. Because now, um, I'm going to prove that a little bit further, that the people in the Old Testament were saved the same way we are today. And we just already saw the sacrifices that they did, they couldn't save them. It's very clear. There's a clear statement in the Bible that says, look, it's not even possible the blood of bulls and goats can, can take away sins. So they were not saved that way. Well, if they weren't saved that way, then how were they saved? In Galatians chapter 3, this is the, the, the chapter we started in. We started reading. We're finally getting back to it. You go ahead and turn there. Galatians chapter 3, we read this earlier, we started off reading this, but in verse number 6 it says, even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Now, Abraham is someone who lived in the Old Testament. Abraham was, was even before the Mosaic Law was introduced. Abraham was... was um, was a man that put his faith in God. And he, was, he lived in the Old Testament. And it says here that Abraham, in verse 6 of chapter 3, even as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness, his faith is what made him righteous. His faith saved him. And it says, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. So if you're of faith today, if you put your faith in Christ, you are a child of Abraham according to the Bible. See, the problem with that, and the reason why he's even bringing this up is that there's a lot of people today that think that because of their origin, because of their nationality, because of their descendancy, who they come from, who they're descended from, because they think they're children of Abraham, and I'm talking about the Jews today, the modern day Jews, there's a lot of people that the, the, the religion of Judaism will teach that they are a special chosen people because of their race, because of who they descended from that they're special and that they have an automatic ticket into heaven because they're physically descended from Abraham. In the Bible, that couldn't be further from the truth. Okay? We need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. 
Now, they could get saved just like anyone else, but they don't have some special plan or some special ticket just because they happen to be born. I mean, you don't choose where you're born. It has nothing to do with anything. Just because they happen to be born under, under, you know, from one set of parents, God doesn't look at that. He's not a respecter of persons and say, oh, well, you're a descendant of Abraham physically, so I'm going to let you into heaven just because of that, just because of who you were born from. That's ridiculous. Physical descendants of Abraham are not saved just by default. You have to have the faith. And that's why he said that the children of, you know, they that which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. So when the Bible talks about these promises that God made to Abraham and to his seed after, excuse me, that's talking about his children that are saved by faith. That's not talking about physical descendants. Look at verse number eight. It says, in the scripture foreseeing, that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, and these shall all nations be blessed. So again, the gospel is something that people will say, oh, that's the New Testament. Well, the Bible says right here that the gospel was preached unto Abraham way back in the Old Testament. The good news, the gospel has been around forever. The good news is that, hey, you can't, the bad news is that you can't do it on your own. You can't do it by works. The good news is all you need is that faith. You put your faith in God. You call upon God. You put your faith in Christ, and he will save you. That is the gospel, my friend, and the gospel was preached unto Abraham. It says, so then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Look at verse number 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. We read that earlier, the reference to that. Everybody that's under the works of the law are under a curse. It says in verse 11, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith. And again, that quote, what he's saying there, he's saying it's evident. He's saying, look, no man can be justified by the law, by obeying the law, to obey the commandments. We're not justified in the sight of God. He says it's evident. The reason why it's evident is because he's pointing back to, guess what, another Old Testament scripture. He's pointing back to Habakkuk 2.4 that says the just shall live by faith. And he's using the Old Testament to prove that, look, we're saved by faith. And over and over again, you'll find that, that, that the New Testament is opening up the Old Testament saying, look, it's been there. It's been there the whole time. And look at verse number 12. He says, and the law is not of faith. So the law is, is not of faith. You, know, it's that you don't need something to, to believe in. You don't have to have faith in something you know, to follow the law. The law is law. It says, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For his written curse is everyone that hangeth on the tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So I told you before to, to look at that word, the promise. That was in Hebrews chapter 9. It says, um, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. And that's why we need faith. Because eternal life is a promise. God makes a promise that I'm going to give you eternal life. We need the faith to believe in that promise. To believe that God is true and to put our faith in that promise and understand that, hey, by faith we know that that God is going to fulfill that promise when we breathe our last breath. We know that God has fulfilled his word because he tells the truth and he's not a liar. We're going to just believe him. Now, the law is something that's here, it's laid out, and you just follow it, and you either, you either do good or you do bad. You don't need faith to, to believe in the law. You need faith in order to, to understand that you have a, a promise of eternal life that's going to be given to you. And that's the faith that we have, and it's this promise. And this promise is referred to over and over again in this chapter in Galatians 3, verse 17. It says, um, oh, we just read that. It says, um, no, it says, yeah, it says in verse 17, it says, And this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. And what he's saying here is that, look, the promise was given ultimately unto Abraham. Abraham existed way before Moses. He existed before the law was even given. So what he's explaining is that, look, because people will try to tell you that you need, the, you know, you have to do the works of the law to be saved. And he says, look, the law which came, you know, basically 430 years after God gave the promise to Abraham, that's when the law was instituted. 430 years later, he says, 
The law that came 430 years later, he said that can't disannul, that can't make that promise void just because the law was introduced later. It doesn't just, just say, okay, yeah, that promise is no good anymore. That it should make the promise of none effect. The promise is in effect. The promise is still there. It's, a, it's God's word. God can't go back on his word. It's a, it's a promise made by God. So when this law comes in, it doesn't make the promise void. He's just added the law. It says in verse 18, for if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more promise. So say, look, if you could get saved, if you get this inheritance in heaven, if you get eternal life by the law, well, that's no longer a promise. You don't have to have faith in that. You just have to obey and be obedient and do what's right and do what's good and just live a good life. Again, that doesn't take faith. That's not, that's not something that would just be a law. And you don't need a promise for that. You just do what's right. It says, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? So you say, well, then why do we even have the law? Why is it there? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Then it goes on and on. Now the mediator is not one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given, which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. It says, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin, we've all sinned, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. So he says right here, verse 24, well, you know, basically, you know, why, why do we even have the law? It says, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we're no longer under schoolmasters. And look, the law is there to convince you of your sin, to convince you that you need a savior. It's a schoolmaster, it's a teacher saying, look, this is what God wants you to do. This is what God expects and demands you to do. When you see the law and you hear the law, you know that you don't follow all those commandments and those rules. And that's why you need, then it brings you to Christ to be justified by faith. So you can put your faith in Christ, realize, hey man, I've sinned, I, I, I'm not good enough. I don't measure up to the law. I need God. I need a savior. I need someone to save my soul. I'm going to put my faith in Christ. And, um, and that's why we even have the law. But see, here's the thing, that the faith doesn't make the law void either. Now, it, it saves you from the curse of the law, because the curse of the law is that you have to go to hell. If you break his law, that, that's, you're cursed for that. Faith will save you from that curse, but it doesn't make the law null and void either. It doesn't, make the, the, it doesn't mean that you don't have to follow or obey the law. And real quickly, I'm going to wrap it up here. Romans 4 also is a good chapter that explains that people in the Old Testament were saved by faith. Again, it has a reference to Abraham being justified by faith. It says in verse four, in, in chapter 4, verse 1, What shall we say then to Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what said the Scripture? Again, he's, you know, all the verses is amazing. He keeps on going back to the Scripture. He's proving what he's saying from the Scripture. And he's going back to the Old Testament. Every time he's going back and proving this stuff, when he says, what said the scripture, anytime you see him saying that in the New Testament, they're always referring to the Old Testament. It says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So again, there's another, another section that talks about Abraham believing God. That's how he got saved. And then in verse 6, it says, even as David also described it, the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. So you can say, okay, well, that was Abraham. This is what people will say, too. They'll say, well, that was Abraham. That was before the law. So, yeah, he was saved by grace back then because that was before the law came. But when the people were here that were living in the time of the law, they had to obey the law, and, and that's how they got saved. Well, the Bible says that David, now, King David was under the Mosaic law. King David came, if you, you know, I don't know how familiar you are, but, but he came in the, in the time. He was the second king of Israel. And he was under the law of Moses at that time. And David's the one who's, who's credited with writing down the, the majority of the book of Psalms. He's the one that God used to, to write down those Psalms. Not all of them, but the majority of them. And he was under the Mosaic law. And this is in Romans 4, verse 6. He's going back to quote one of the scriptures that David wrote. It says, Even as David also described it, the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. 
David was under the law. He said the same exact thing. That, that God imputes righteousness without works, without following the law, without obeying the law. Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. That's a great blessing. And then we're, I'm going to jump down to verse 13 in Romans 4. It says, For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law. The promise, again, he's saying, is not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void. So say faith is, is meaningless if, if you receive righteousness by the law. It says, And the promise made of none effect, because the law worketh wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So it's evident. I, I'm sure I, I, I can't even, you know, if you, if you don't understand that Abraham was saved by faith at this point, then you got a lot of reading to do so because there's the scripture after scripture has explained that. David also wrote about being saved without works. And it's also evident that people knew that a Messiah was coming. So they didn't even think back then that, I mean, some people did, but, but a lot of people knew that it was by faith then too. And that's evidenced by, you had the woman at the well who knew that Messiah was coming and says, when he comes, he's going to show us all things. Um, there were the wise men from the east. You know, you, you typically hear about the three wise men that came. The reason why they even knew that, that Jesus Christ was being born because they knew the scripture. They knew that the Old Testament talked about the Savior coming, and they were looking for the signs of his coming because God had, had prophesied and given them the signs. That's why they were even able to come after the birth of Jesus Christ to see him as a newborn baby and to give him those gifts because they knew the Scripture. And I'm not going to go there for sake of time, but I had this in my notes in Luke chapter 2. There's an old man that basically was revealed to him that he was going to see the Savior of the world before he died. And he went into the temple, and that's when he saw where they were bringing in Jesus Christ on the eighth day. And, and he saw him, and he, and he said, um, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of, the people of, Israel, of thy people Israel. He knew Jesus was coming. The people in the Old Testament, basically, here's a good way to look at it. In the New Testament... We look back to Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection to get saved. He already did that in our time frame. We knew that he, you know, he did that. The scripture tells us he did that. We put our faith on him to be saved. Well, in the Old Testament, before Jesus did that, they were looking in the future. They knew, because the Bible says that all the prophets prophesied of Jesus Christ. All of them. All of the prophets said from the beginning of the world. So even before God's word was actually written down, God spoke, God used prophets to preach unto the people. All of the prophets of God prophesied of Jesus Christ coming to pay for the sins of the whole world. So in the Old Testament, before Jesus Christ actually came to this earth, they put their faith on the fact that, they, that he was coming and that he was going to save them from their sins. In the New Testament, we just look backward. It's just a difference of what, where you are in the time spectrum. You're looking forward, you're looking backwards. Either way, it's Jesus Christ that's saving you, and either way, it's by faith in him. Because it's only faith that saves. And that's what it says in Acts uh, 10, 43. It says, To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. All the prophets witness that. Whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Dispensational teaching is nothing but a bunch of lies. Don't be deceived by it. Don't let anyone tell you, oh, no, no, no. It's all different for these different people. <laughs> Beware when people try to tell you that certain parts of the Bible are not meant for you, too. And this is, I mean, they get into these crazy teachings, and they'll say, oh, well, the, uh, the Gospels were not for you, or this Gospel is not for you, it's for the Jews, or, you know, we follow the epistles of Paul and not what Peter said. And they'll say, you know, Peter was the apostle of the Jews, and Paul was the apostle of the Gentiles. They'll say all these different things, excuse me. That's not true. The Bible says that all Scripture... All scripture is given by, by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The entire Bible is for you. All of it. Every word, every verse, every line, it's for you. You don't need to get caught up in this stuff. People just, they, I don't know why they do it. They just think that, um, 
It's like they're getting too smart for themselves. You, know, you don't need to, to make the Bible more complicated or more difficult than it is. It's given to us. And I'll tell you what. The gospel that Peter, that Peter preached is the same gospel that the gospel Paul preached. It's the same gospel that was preached unto Abraham. And it's the same gospel that's been preached all throughout time. The good news of faith. It doesn't matter where you were born. It doesn't matter who your parents are. What matters is... is if you become a child of Abraham, you become a child of God by putting your faith in Christ. That's what matters. So tonight we're going to go through, because I'm, I'm out of time, tonight I'm going to go through some more of the, I mean that was just salvation. I really wanted to make sure we, we covered salvation because a lot of people think, think weird things about that. And people have always been saved by grace. But tonight we're going to go over a lot more of like the actual laws and what changes were really made. Because there's a lot, there were some changes. Like I said, we don't do the sacrifices today. We don't do animal burnt offerings. But at the same time, that doesn't mean thou shalt not kill is gone from the law. That's still there. So we're going to look a little bit heavier tonight into, well, what are the differences and what are the changes? Because I'll tell you what, the, 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 the biggest reason why people want to tell you that we don't have to obey the law and, we don't, and we're in the New Testament, we don't need to listen to that, is because of their own sin. They don't want to admit or accept that something that they're doing is wrong. It's a lot easier to, to take a big chunk of the Bible and say, yeah, uh, we're in the New Testament, well, I don't need this anymore. This stuff in here, that's old, that's Old Testament. I don't need this. Which is, is just silly. There's no reason that God has to repeat himself Everything in the New Testament has to, you know, whatever you wanted to keep in the Old Testament. No, that's not the way it works. So let's uh, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity. God, I pray that you you made it clear in our hearts and and just understand and, and that we wouldn't get twisted because there's a lot of deceivers out there, dear God. There's a lot of people who are going to try to try to unsettle our faith and and just and bring in weird false doctrine. God, it takes a long time to get founded in the truth, but I pray that, that just little by little you can help us to just understand more of your word, help us to get, to get settled in your word, and, and to use the clear statements of the Bible to, to help us understand what, what, is, what the truth is, and that we could um, understand the word is perfect, and that you preserved it for us today in 2013 uh, without error for us, and... Um, just help us to be able to understand your words. And I pray that you please just bless everyone that's here today as we go our separate ways. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.